Hello, it's James from xrobots.co.uk. This is part one of my real working Iron Man exoskeleton arm. This isn't it. At the end of the last construction part of Hulkbuster, which is behind me, and yes, I'm still due to do a testing video, I put up a poll and asked people to vote on what project they'd like to see next, as well as my other main projects, of which one is Ultron. And you voted for a real working exosuit power arm that's going to make me really strong. So this is a fictional arm from my last project, based of course on Iron Man. And I can tell you that the working one is going to have to be a lot bigger because that tiny thing there isn't big enough to put a motor in to make my elbow really strong or any of the other joints on the suit. So we're going to do some investigation today about motors and how to power it. It is going to be electric because that's the most accessible and easiest and probably safest thing to do. It could be pneumatic or hydraulic, uh, but particularly hydraulic is quite hard because there's lots of compressed oil. You'll need a sump and a compressor big enough to compress it at a high enough rate to move. Um, with every cylinder move, obviously, it has to fill or empty that cylinder with oil, and the same with pneumatics. So I don't really want to cast around a compressor and an engine or a big electric motor to power it. Obviously, if I made the whole suit and it was really strong, then I could carry the compressor with me and fuel and so on to power it. Uh, but for the purposes of this project, we're going to start with the arm. We're going to look at electric motors today to see what sort of motor I could use that's stronger than me, essentially. So let's have a look. My original idea was to use one of these, which is a windscreen wiper motor. Now these are fairly hefty motors, as you can see. I've used these in other projects like BB-8 version 2 and version 3. Um, these have a big DC motor, a brushed motor, with a uh, kind of a worm gear in here. So there's a worm gear and a big gear. And then the output shaft is this thing in the middle. And obviously when you're driving down the motorway at 70 miles an hour and the wipers are still wiping the windscreen fine, and it's blowing a gale, you know there's quite a lot of torque in here and they're quite reliable. So um, the amount of power you get from one of these, uh, basically if I stall it by grabbing this with a wrench and putting say 12 volts on it, um, it draws about seven amps. So if I were to power it from um, you know, an 11.1 volt LiPo or something, say we've got say 10 or 11 volts, um, we're gonna get roughly you know, 70 or a bit more watts out of this in terms of its power consumption. But DC motors aren't very efficient because the magnets are fixed and the commutator rotates round and there are brushes which um, you know don't transfer power very effectively. Um, also this motor is from a long time ago. I have a box of these I acquired a few years ago um, as scrap. And this style of motor was in cars in probably the 80s or before. So obviously magnets, rare earth magnets have come along and motors have got a lot efficient and a lot smaller since then. We're going to look back now at a video I made in December 2014 where I was exhibiting with the R2-D2 builders at a model engineering show at Sandown Park. So there were lots of trains and stuff, tools and things like that to buy. This video is in my channel if you want to look at it. And I was there with the R2-D2 Builders Club. So that included, in fact, Oliver Steeples, who um, has since worked at Pinewood building the real R2-D2 for Episode 7, and he was in my uh, video recently of Star Wars Celebration where he was actually on the Droid Builders panel. There we go, there's his own R2-D2. At the time, Oliver was looking at motors, and this is a J-car motor, which is just a DC motor with a gearbox on, and he's saying a lot of the builders, the shaft shears, and they're not really up to much. So um, many builders around the world use these to power their R2-D2s, which is the back end of a scooter, an electric scooter. And these are, um, there we go, 24 volts DC, 120 watt motors, so even heftier than the wiper motor I just showed you, um, with the um, output shaft just uh, powering a belt and uh, powering the back wheel directly. A lot of the builders run them on 12 volts because they're just too fast for R2-D2. But obviously this is quite a hefty assembly, yeah, he's saying it weighs quite a bit. And obviously it's massive. It's even bigger than that wiper motor. So um, he's looking at more efficient options. So what comes up next is, in fact, this assembly, which is a Bainbots gearbox. Um, and it's a 16 to 1 planetary gearbox. And the motor on there is a brushless outrunner. So that's similar to the ones using quadcopters and radio-controlled models, um, which is much more efficient. And um, yeah, it's got three wires because it's a brushless motor, so it needs a brushless motor controller. 
But uh, basically the point of this is that with a 100mm wheel on, in fact this thing was able to push him along on a skateboard or something. Um, so it's um, more than powerful enough and in fact as we'll see in a bit of footage in a moment, quite fast enough. So compared to the physical size and the weight, this is a much more efficient option. So here's another video I made in uh, August the next year, and this is actually in the So Make It YouTube channel, which is my local makerspace that I'm a trustee of. Um, so this is Oliver again, he's now fitted the um, brushless motors into his droid, and as you can see there, it's, it's pretty nippy, and I'm not sure if that's even flat out, but uh, perfectly acceptable, and obviously powerful enough, compared to having those scooter motors. So I've done quite a bit of investigation into brushless motors and in fact I've got one here, you'll notice it's got three leads and you need um, one of these special drivers, this is a really cheap one that costs about £10, um, it's probably not powerful enough but it'll run the motor. So uh, this motor you'll notice is different to the one Oliver had, this is an in-runner and what he had was an out-runner. So having looked into it, this is the sort of thing you have in a radio control car and the out-runners are typically what you get on quadcopters and so on. So the out-runners go slower and have more torque but they turn the propellers directly, whereas you'd think that you would need that sort of motor in a car, but actually motors run more efficient when they're going quickly. So to get good acceleration, you want the motor to be going really quickly and have a really good gear train, so you get lots of torque. So basically the motor's running at a fast speed when the other end of the gearbox is going slowly, and that means you can start and stop reliably. So for robotics and things like that, what you really want is the in-runner, which is this style of motor. Now this motor um, is a 2250 kV which means it will do 2250 revs per minute per volt. So on um, say an 11.1 .1 volt LiPo flat out it will do um, nearly 25,000 revs per minute. So we're going to need some serious gearing on this. The other thing about this is it's sensorless, it's just got three wires and the way these work is by pulsing the windings in turn to make this this uh, output shaft turn. So that's what the controller does with three wires. So um, with the censored ones, have Hall effect sensors in the back, it can tell exactly what the position of the motor is. So it knows which winding to pulse to start it. This is sensorless, so it just starts pulsing them and hopefully the motor catches up. So they're sometimes a bit dodgy to start up, but they don't start up smoothly. But with a lot of gear train in front of it, that's not really a problem because at the other end of the gear train, you don't see the jitter. So we can basically get away with these rather than an expensive sensors brushless motor and a sensored driver if we put enough gears on it but obviously this does spin incredibly fast the power consumption of this maximum is 80 amps so more than 10 times this in fact pretty much so um we're, we're talking about many times more power nearly a kilowatt in fact um, or the best part thereof if we run it flat out on maximum load so we're getting much better power density compared to this 10 times the power consumption at least um, for a fraction of the size. Obviously we need to put a gearbox on but we probably would on this anyway realistically. In terms of providing that sort of current I've got some batteries here. These are a 2.2 amp hour and a 5 amp hour 11.1 volt LiPo batteries and these are rated at 20 to 30 C which means that you can draw 20 to 30 times this rated current all at once. So for a 5 amp hour I can draw, well 25s is 100, 35s is 150, so I could draw somewhere between 100 and 150 amps from this um, in one go and it would be happy with that. Um, obviously it wouldn't last very long because its capacity is only 5 amp hour, so I can draw 5 amps for an hour, or um, if I were to draw 20 times the capacity it would be 20 times less than an hour. This one of course is still 20 to 30 C but it's only 2.2 amp hour so I can only draw about 40 or a bit amps from that in one go. So we should have enough power to power an 80 amp motor even if it's flat out. We might need several of these batteries, maybe one for each axis. And obviously when they go flat I can just swap them out for some charged ones, don't have to worry about the compressor for hydraulics or pneumatics. This motor driver I think is a 30 amp one so I'm probably going to need to upgrade that but it's good enough for testing. So let's power it up. The way you normally use these is with a radio control receiver and the motor driver plugs straight in, uh, the battery's plugged into the motor driver and obviously the motor is as well. And that gives you power for your radio control receiver and obviously your transmitter is over here and it's all wireless. Um, this is the same sort of thing that I can control with an Arduino servo command so I can control this driver or a similar one straight from an Arduino. For now I just happen to have all this stuff so I'm just going to test the motor uh, with the remote. 
So I've um, connected this to one of the channels on this, which is this little knob. So if I turn the knob, you should find the motor starts up. So that's going pretty slow. That's about as slow as I can go. If I go any slower, it stops. But it's not full speed. If I turn up, Now, I can't really tell how fast that's going, but it's going really fast. And I'm not going to grab it because I already tried that and it burnt me. So uh, what we really need to do is make some sort of gear train so we can realistically see what we can get out of this and try and test the torque. That's already got quite warm, actually. Um, now, you'll notice I've got a uh, belt uh, pulley on here, which I think is a T5. And I've got some T5 belts. And I previously experimented with making a T5 pulley. With a gear on, and this hasn't been in any projects, but here we go, this fits perfectly. It took quite a lot of trial and error to make this 3D print, which I did manually. So um, what we're going to do is make an assembly to drive this and the gear train from there. Now what I really want is a, a precision metal gearbox on here, um, and then put some 3D printed gears on the end of that. But I don't have one that fits. So uh, the best thing to do, I think, so that we don't end up mashing a 3D printed gear at 20,000 RPM or whatever, is to use belt drive for the first stage, and then take gears once I've slowed it down through one stage here, so take bigger gears off here, smaller and bigger, till we get it to a reasonable speed, and then we can test the torque a little bit. So here's a little bit of the gear train. Obviously, I've got my um, toothed pulley and a little small gear on top there in turquoise. And then we're going to have another gear there that goes so it goes small to big to small and then another one and then we'll just stack these up on two parallel shafts until we get to the right sort of speed and every one of these is a three to one reduction we've got eight teeth on the small gear and we've got 24 on the big gear so that should reduce quite quickly in each stage now it's not the sort of best type of high torque gearbox just having spur gears it would be better to have a planetary gearbox but i'm not going to try and make one of those for now we're just going to do this and see how much reduction we can get and how much force or torque is on the end of that. Um, the whole thing's going to be mounted on this sort of assembly. So we've got our two parallel shafts running through the purple parts. And then we've got the motor there. And it can slide up and down a bit so I can adjust the belt tension. That's about the size of the motor. So obviously on the right hand side we'll have that toothed pulley. I've got my gears printed and I've put my motor in this mount that I'm going to uh, mount the studding through to mount the gears on. So these are ABS gears, it's probably not the best choice for a really tough gearbox. In the future I will probably use something like this which is Tallman Alloy which is a nylon material which is really tough so that would be much better for gears. It's getting on towards the same strength as some metals. Uh, but for now we're just going to test with ABS because it's easy to print. And um, obviously I'm just going to be running these gears on studding, which is a terrible idea. Um, but again, it's only for a test of, sort of a quick test of torque. Eventually spinning at least as fast as the fastest gear, they would melt. Uh, so it's not a great way to build a gearbox. Essentially we should have a bearing encapsulated in there, a bit like the guide wheels in my BB-8 version 3. But we're going to put all this together and see what happens anyway. Um, it is quite noisy now. So the motor's a lot more noisy now it's attached to this big piece of plastic. Now it's probably going to be even noisier when the gears are in there, but let's assemble it and see what happens. I've assembled it. It's the most awful noisy gearbox ever. So I've got a whole series of these grey gears. And then I've got this black gear with a lever on. So my motor driver doesn't have reverse on, so this can slide up and down and it clutches with the final small gear at the bottom there. In fact, the small gear on the output isn't really big enough. Um, but nonetheless, I can test the amount of torque by grabbing this handle. So we're just going to run it without the handle. It's extremely noisy and rattly. And um, obviously, as I say, it's a terrible gearbox, but it will do for now to test. So if I put this lever on, so we can see on the final output stage, if I just that's slow speed. And that's full speed. So um, it is actually very torquey indeed. So if I try and somehow grab hold of this, I can't actually stop that with my hand. 
skipped a couple of gears there and I'm probably, you can already see there's actually damage on this black gear. Haven't quite snapped one but they're starting to get uh, kind of slightly indented there. The motor drive is getting pretty hot, it's only a 30 amp motor driver and as I say the maximum pull of current on the motor is 80 amps and the battery can't provide that either. But that felt pretty tough to me so let's see if I can do some sort of strength test with it. So I actually minced that gear, you can see the teeth are broken actually on it there. So I've printed a new one, which you can just see in here, it's um, printed in black, it's 100% infill, and it's also got a wider little gear on it to mesh properly with this. So I've now attached this to a tow rope, which is tied around a parallel bar on the table, with the lever facing off, and we're going to see how much mass we can lift. Right, the first test is an 8 kilogram kettlebell. I've got one attached here, and that's actually taking the strain now, so provided this doesn't slip off. Let's try turning that on. Not too many troubles there. The next test is two 8 kilogram kettlebells. So I've got 16 kilograms. Let's give that a go. Last time I didn't turn the knob up very high. And there go the gears. So again, of course, the uh, small gear here is broken where the uh, bigger lever interlocks with it, which is exactly the same thing that happened last time, which means these ABS gears are nowhere near strong enough. But let's think about how much force we did lift or how much torque we had around the output shaft here uh, considering we did lift one of these kettlebells. Now this is 8 kilograms but this shaft is 15 centimetres long and normally when you buy a motor you'll see a kilogram centimetre rating and that's basically the stall torque for the motor. It's kind of a bodged linear force measurement of how much it can lift at one centimetre radius on its output shaft of the gearbox or the motor. So uh, basically, if we were to convert this into kilogram centimetres, for 8 kilograms it would be 15 times more, because this is 15 times longer. So we would have had 120 kilograms uh, per centimetre, if you like, of torque um, compared to normal ratings. So comparing that with the wiper motor, this is about 40 kilogram centimetres. So already we've got um, an assembly if the gears, well the gears did survive in fact to lift 8 kilograms. So already this assembly has three times the torque of this wiper motor. If we had lifted both without the gears failing, of course it would be double again at 240 kilograms of being able to lift one centimetre there and I'm easily uh, pretty sure it could have done that because the motor driver didn't even get warm. Remember that's a maximum of 30 amps and the motor can draw a maximum of 80 so if this had got really hot and exploded and passed 30 uh, then we'd know we'd have passed 30 amps but as it is it's completely unaffected and didn't really get hot so we're nowhere near the maximum power for the motor. So I'm pretty sure we could have lifted at least 20 or 30 kilograms if the gears hadn't failed. That would have given us somewhere between 300 and 400 kilograms at one centimetre. And of course if we added another one to three gear we'd get um, a speed reduction down to another third, but another three times the torque and that's 900 to 1000 kilograms of torque at one centimetre or kilograms of force being lifted. So that's basically a metric tonne out of this tiny motor. So a thousand kilogram centimetres or a thousand kilograms of lifting force per centimetre of radius sounds like it should be alright for my power arm project and it's certainly pretty economical considering the cost of industrial motors with that kind of torque. But it looks like we need stronger gears or some other way of conveying the force through the gear train. Uh, but looking at the other end everything looks perfectly intact so we've got this kind of rubber belt here that's not even particularly tight and it's not particularly well aligned and it's going on to a 3D printed T5 pulley that's pretty low profile um, and the rest of the gears look perfectly intact even though they're only ABS. In fact they all look fine up to the last one where that little gear snapped and that's basically because considering the motor can max out at 20,000 RPM um, and the other end here is probably doing 50 to 100 RPM at that speed this side's actually going 400 times faster, but it's also 400 times less torque to convey uh, torque from one stage to the next, or this very end, in fact, on the actual motor shaft. So uh, we could still use ABS gears at that end. Um, probably as we go through the gear train, we should make them tougher, maybe Tormann alloy in the middle, and then finally metal gears. Um, there are more effective gearboxes where there are more than one gear per stage, like planetary gearboxes, um, but maybe gears aren't the right answer. Obviously with, with gears then we've got all of that force is pretty much on each gear because there's only one or two gears meshing at a time. And that's why this one has failed because basically having that lever with such a massive weight on it's put all the force that's required on just one of these teeth. 
This is the back end of a bicycle upside down. So this is the back wheel and these are of course the pedals. And you'll notice that uh, bicycles have chains that go around the sprockets. There's two main reasons for that. One is of course that uh, the pedals aren't really near the drive wheel. So if we had gears, they'd have to be really close or they'd have to be lots of gears next to each other to cover the distance. And also the chain is much better at conveying higher torques. And you'll notice the chain, of course, is wrapped all the way around the sprocket. So that means it grips on every tooth. So instead of just having the force on the two teeth or the two or three teeth that are meshing at the time, it goes around all of them so all of those teeth can pull and convey the force along the chain and the torque around the wheels and around the pedal. So perhaps on the final stage, a chain drive might be the answer. I actually went out on my bike recently and I caught the sun a little bit and that's why my face suddenly got redder between shots. But that's nothing really to do with the project. All right, so probably that's enough playing around with plastic gears and chains and motors. What I really need to decide next is how the suit looks. Is it anything like this? Probably not. It's probably much bigger and probably sits outside my arm with all these massive motors and gearboxes on. Although they're actually not that big. But I need to decide where the axis are and how the whole thing is going to hang together. Also need to decide where the controls are, whether they're joysticks I hold or whether they're things inside the arm I push on. I'm a bit reluctant to put my arm down inside tubes in case there's a problem and I say I build both arms and my arms are stuck in and I, it goes out of control and I can't stop it. So I think I'm going to have a big emergency stop but it'd be great if I could just let go. So next time I'm going to think about the structure for the suit how those control mechanisms work. Obviously there's quite a lot more to implement in software in the future, but first of all we need to decide where the mechanical axis are so we can decide where those gearboxes go and where any potential chain drive goes. So don't forget to subscribe for more updates on this project and the other projects. You can see a preview video after this. All right, that's all for now.